Hi everyone and welcome to a Hangout on Air. Good morning from Zoo Atlanta. Today we're excited to be collaborating with the Wildlife Conservation Society on this 96 Elephants Hangout. Zoo Atlanta has partnered up with over 100 zoos and aquariums to support Wildlife Conservation Society's 96 Elephants and hope to draw attention to the plight of wild African elephants and what you can do to help. Today I'm so excited to be joined by our amazing panel. They are really amazing scientists and there's also an elephant. I'd like to give some introductions. Joining us from Edinburgh, Scotland, we have Wildlife Conservation Society, <coughs> excuse me, Woo. conservation biologist Dr. Fiona Mizell. Hi Fiona, is it okay to call you Boo? Everybody calls me Boo. Love it, that's a wonderful name. Also from Wildlife Conservation Society, we have Associate Conservation Scientist Andrea Tercalo. Hi, Andrea. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, right around the corner from me, as I am at the elephant barn right now, we have our lead keeper in elephants, Nate Elgart. Hey, Nate. Good morning, guys. Good morning. And he's going to introduce us to our 8,000 pound panelist, Kelly the African Elephant. <laughs> who's busy eating right now. This is part of Google's Connected Classrooms, and we're so excited to be broadcasting to two high schools today. Right now, we have Wilson High School in Westlawn, Pennsylvania. If you guys could wave. <laughs> and then we have a few classrooms from Charlestown High School in Charlestown, Indiana. Woohoo! Thank you all for joining us. If you're watching this live and you would like to submit your questions, feel free to use the Q&A app on Google+. Also use the hashtag 96ElephantsHOA on Twitter at Google, and we'll try to get to your questions. So I kind of want to start off with Dr. Mizell Fu. To give us some background on 96 elephants, why is it so important that this message is coming out right now? Well, elephants have been poached for a very, very long time, but it's only um, in our lifetimes, or at least probably in the, in the lifetimes of the students in the classes, that it's become so desperately serious. Um, WCS has been awesome since 1897 on, um, on wildlife. And I had a little look yesterday at the history of the project on elephants that we have supported. And the very first one was in 1962, which is maybe before a lot of your mums and dads were born. Um, and um, and I, I found an old document from 1991, which dates from before the internet. It is here. And then if you look um, on one of the pages here, we have a mention of Andrea Turcalo. So she was already working on elephants in 1991 and already with WCS. But in about 2006, the price of ivory went up in the Far East. and. The coaching has just gone through the roof since then. And um, a lot of colleagues in the conservation world have been trying to find out how many elephants there are at the moment, how many there used to be. And we know that world night and day. So the, by the time you guys have got up and eaten your breakfast, that's another one gone. You know, it's absolutely shocking. So that's why we call it 96 elephants, because 96 elephants a day are being killed for just you know little statues to put on the on the the mantelpiece, like you can see behind me. You know, I've got little I've got things made of cow dung, which are not you know those are completely sustainable and painted different colours. But some people like to have ivory, especially in the Far East. Um, so it's a campaign. It's 96 elephants is a campaign to try to save elephants. Has anybody got questions yet? Okay, let's try Q and A. Um, why? Someone asked from online, "Why is ivory so valuable?" It's um, it's has for a long time been seen as valuable in. Um, in the Far East, but also used to be considered valuable in Europe and America. 
And the main reason is because you can carve it any which way and it doesn't break, um, which is supposed to be you know, a valuable attribute in something to be carved. I've got a, I've got a wooden carving here from the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. And you can see most of the lines are up and down. If you tried to carve this piece of wood that way, it would all break into little bits across the grain. Ivory doesn't have grain, uh, which is why people can make very intricate carvings out of it. Okay. Can I add to that? You can get elephants. Can I add to that? Yes, please. Um, I also think, you know, the idea that this is coming from an elephant gives it a certain mystique. And, you know, and I think a lot of people think it's a privilege to own such a material. It is a commodity. It's like, it's become like gold or, you know, rare metals or certain wood. So, yeah, it's a, it's a very um, complicated question why people want this. I mean, it might put you in a, in a certain class of people who can afford this and give you status also. Yeah, um, I know that's an issue for a rhino horn right now too, and especially in Southeast Asia, it's it's more of a status symbol than anything else. Um, someone else, uh, if you guys knew the answer to this, how much is ivory? What do you mean? How much is it worth? Yes. If you read the websites, um, over, once it's once it's been carved into an art object in by very skillful carvers, then there is really no price per kilogram that is too much because it depends on the, you're actually paying for the artist who could be using his or her skills on something else. Um, but when the raw ivory goes and lands in the Far East, it's something like more than $1,000 a kilo. Mm -hmm. A kilo is about 2.2 2 .2 pounds. Um, can can you go into the background of, I know you guys have been working with elephants in the field for a very long time, um, and, and lately, I, I've, I checked out the website, it seems to be that the numbers are getting worse for elephants. Um, how long has, have you seen this? I mean, can you give us some more history on that? Andrea, you started long before I did. Yeah, but you did the, uh, let, let's clarify this. Boo is the statistician. She's the person that really can do the stuff with the data. That's my colleague, Samantha. And, <laughs> and I'm just the longtime field person that can stay in the field and you know observe these elephants. Um, when I started in 1990 on this long-term study, uh, I lived in an area uh, in Zangabai, which is in the Central African Republic, at this amazing place where I could observe these animals firsthand. And uh, we did have poaching then. And there's always been poaching in the area. But we've had less in our area because of the, we protect these elephants pretty well. Um, the main change I've seen in over the years, and this is the same throughout Africa, is the change in human demographics, which means how many people and where these people are. And I think that is the main problem facing elephants right now. Because when I started the study, there were very few people to the direct um, east of us, which is actually the, um, uh, uh, the Republic of Congo. But in the last, say, 14 years, there's been a lot more human activity in that area and a lot more poaching, I would assume, is going on. And we're seeing a compression of elephants in our area, which means the numbers are probably increasing, but it's not due to beca because of them being protected better. It's because they're moving into our area. So I would say the main major problem facing elephants today is the change in human demographics because where you see people move into areas, you see elephants move out or be poached. Um, I would to that, if I may. Oh, yes. Not only demographics, but it's also also the industrial exploitation yes. of a lot of these yeah. forests. Yeah. Just, you know, they were roadless and there was very few people. It used to be that going from your site, Andrea, to say Macau, that used to take eight days walking, didn't it? Yes. And now it well. can be done in four hours in a truck because now there's a road. And the whole of Central Africa has been covered in roads in the last 20 to 30 years. So yes. now you can get bullets and guns and people into a very, very remote area and you can get the ivory out really, really fast. And the whole thing's just skyrocketed. 
Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, that's why the human demographic has changed is because there's, you know, there's logging going on, there's extraction of minerals in these areas. So areas that were, like we said, empty 10, 20 years ago are now full of people. And we've mm -hmm. seen that during the time we've been in Central Africa. Yeah. But, you know, if you step back and look at the even bigger picture, most of Central Africa, the economics is based on what? It's based on extraction of natural resources. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of this extraction, it's being illegally done or not up to, say, um, legislative uh, uh, mandates. So people are going in and extracting lumber, and a lot of it's being done illegally. Mm -hmm. And minerals are being extracted, diamonds, uh, coltan, uh, uranium. I mean, the, the area is, is incredibly rich. So if, you're de if your economy is depending just on this type of um, extract extracted processes, then you know these areas are being invaded by people. There has to be a different type of economic development in Africa, yeah, more of a manufacturing basis, and to get people out of these areas and not invading areas that were formerly free of people. So I think it's a big failure of um, central governments in many ways. We have a... I'm that is, sorry. That has led to this enormous poaching problem. Uh, I hate to interrupt. I will, we have another question that kind of goes along with that. Um, somewhat, Our classroom, they actually uh, texted it because of the audio problems earlier. How big of a factor is the U.S. in the trade of ivory? You want to answer that, Boo? That's, uh, that's a good question. It's the U.S. trade of ivory. Um, about 70% of ivory that is poached now goes to China. Of the rest, it goes um, kind of part of part of it goes circuitously as well to China, and some of it used to go to the U.S. Um, completely illegally, um, and the U.S. government has now clamped down on that. Um, it, it's much more strict. I think you must have all read about the recent laws that have been passed, um, but. Um, you know, we need we need more awareness. Um, there's a whole bunch of things on the 96 Elephants website that you can look at. There's an advocacy toolkit where you can learn about these things and you can speak to your family, speak to your friends. If you're from um, a Chinese background, many you know many many people in America have uh, Chinese mums or dads or grandmothers or grand great grandmothers, so that the culture. Um, the American culture is basically not to buy ivory, but there's still the Chinese culture that um, is there with, you know, with your grandmas and everybody. And so you can talk to your families and talk to your friends and say, hey, you know, ivory actually comes from dead elephants. And, you know, if we're not very careful, your children won't be able to learn from their alphabet books anymore where E is for elephant. It's going to have to be E is for egg. Because kids are going to say, what, what's an elephant? Is it those things we see in books, like dinosaurs? Mm. You know, so that's, that's something you can do. So the American, the American ivory um, issue is very much one of awareness raising, raising I think. Uh, one of the questions kind of to go along with that are, what are the laws in the US that are doing to protect the elephants? or prohibit the ban sale of ivory? Um, you, you now can't take any ivory out of America um, according to quite a new law that has been passed um, by government. But I, I don't know. Andrea, do you know more details about that? I'm not too sure about it. I know um, this has caused a big furor amongst um, musicians. Yeah who, you know, may have some inlay ivory on a, you know, a musical instrument. I'm, I'm kind of fuzzy. I think, I, I, I'm not sure of how much of this is being enforced yet, but I think it's on the books. But I, yeah. I think maybe some of it may be a bit extreme at this point. I think it has to be maybe handled individually, but, um, yeah. The problem is that if you've got a piece of ivory and it's um, very old, yeah. Then normally it would have been from an elephant that was killed before there was any kind of a ban. You know, imagine yeah. it's an old musical instrument from a piano where the keys have been, you know, 
carved out of ivory from an elephant that was killed in 1902, for example. But somebody can turn up with a piano and say, well, this is a really old piano. How do you prove it? It's actually extremely difficult. You have to yeah. subject ivory to really quite complicated technical tests that have got yeah. to do with the yeah. radioactive um, carbon within it. Yeah. Um, it's easier to learn a whole lot. But yeah. I think that has been a, a recent dispensation, I think just a couple of days ago, by the American government to say that very, very old stuff that can be proven to be really old can be sent to another country. Uh, one of the questions from the high school, from Lauren from Wilson High, is is it possible for elephants to regrow their tusk? No. Andre? No. Um, think of elephant tusks as they're just modified incisors. They're like your front teeth. Um, I think actually Nate has. Um, well, go ahead, keep going. I'm sorry. And if, you, if an elephant loses a tusk, it doesn't regenerate, it's gone. Um. But if well, it breaks off, it grows a bit, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. If it breaks off a portion, yes, it, it can grow to a certain extent. But once a tusk is uh, completely falls out, it's gone. It's it's finished. Um, so I saw that there was a suggestion from some people who were saying, "Why don't we just saw off all the elephant's tusks <laughs> and that poachers have nothing to to poach them for?" And I think this is what Nate is going to show us. There's a huge bunch of tusk still inside the head. And so a poacher will go and kill an elephant, even if the tusks have been sawn up off at the, at the mouth area. Yeah, but part of that is hollow. Killing the head. But part of that inner tusk is hollow. In yeah, but I bet it can be made into little tiny thin bits for no. guitar. Yeah, but I don't think it would be, I don't think it would be worth the, t I mean, to extract tusks from elephants is highly expensive and I don't think it's, you know, they've done it with rhinos because they have so few rhinos left, but in terms of elephants, the expense would be, I mean, in trying to capture elephants to saw those tusks off. That's right. You end up and some other people were suggesting dyeing the tusks, so you have to first go and catch all your elephants and dye the tusks. Well, it's all labor intensive, it's, it's, it wouldn't even be worth it. You better off just... 300,000 elephants. So, um... I confess I was really excited about this hangout too because I remember um, seeing 60 Minutes with Andrea Tercalo talking about the forest elephants in Africa and the amazing field work you did and it left a big impression on me. Um, I know you were, there. there's still a lot of threats there. Can you kind of go over what the current threats are and why this campaign is so important right now? Um, well, I actually had to leave Zonga last year in May because of the um, rebel activity uh, in Central African Republic, but I've been watching the situation. What happened after I left in May of 2013, um, rebels that had invaded the, well, had been in the country, they came to our area and they killed 26 elephants. But I have to say, since that incident, there's been no further poaching in the clearing, which is pretty amazing in itself. Um, I'm sorry, what was your previous question? I'm sort of <laughs> it's okay. Uh, I guess what are the current threats and then why is this campaign so important right now? Well, I think it, it, I think the campaign is really important. Like Boo said, there's been such a marked decrease in elephant numbers, um, in particularly forest elephants, but now we're seeing an upsurge in poaching everywhere. I read an article this morning where there's been an elephant poached in Kruger in South Africa, and that hasn't happened in, in years. Um, I mean, the current threats are there are a couple of things that, that are going on. Right now we have a lot of civil unrest and people have access to automatic weapons and that's probably the biggest threat facing elephants in most of Africa. We have a lot of civil unrest, we have um, rebel activity and especially in Central Africa when you compare that area to most of the continent we probably have more civil unrest than in any area. And also we have local poverty, which, um, you know, a lot of people, they don't have employment options as we do in the United States. We talk about unemployment being high in the U.S., but when you go to Africa, in many areas, it's up to 90%. So people have to pay for a living when they get up in the morning. The is that uh, alternative to make money. You know. So I think between civil unrest and poverty, 
those are the probably the two biggest problems facing elephants at this point. Um, so I, I was um, chatting earlier about Nate, and we had to unmute him. Sorry for the added noise. Um, we've been talking about elephants, and I think it's really important as part of this hangout that we actually meet one. So um, I kind of want to take it over to Nate so he can kind of show you some of the ivory and some of the anatomy and what we do here at Sioux Atlanta for enrichment. Sure. Um, so we're going to introduce you guys to Kelly today. Uh, Kelly is a 31-year-old African elephant. She's been at Zoo Atlanta since 1986, so almost 30 years. Uh, we do a lot of training with our girls, and you guys are going to get to see some of that today. Um, all the training that we do with our elephants, for the most part, are considered husbandry behaviors, the things that help us take care of them. Uh, the first thing we're going to show you is those, is those tusks that we've been talking about this whole time. Um, Kelly's tusk here, you're only looking at about, at about a third of the tusk, like we said earlier. Um, the rest of her tusk Can you go down there maybe? Oh. going up into her head, so they're actually going up further under her lip. Um, uh, found some other things as well. Um, these tusks, they, if they break off the tip, um, that section can grow, and elephants will continue to grow their tusks throughout their lives. Um, what we were talking about earlier is if you break off the whole tusk, just like a tooth, um, it's not going to grow back. Uh, some more about Kelly. Kelly is about 8,000 pounds, just under 8,000 pounds now. Uh, she is full grown, and she's about eight and a half feet tall, right at the shoulder. All the training you're seeing uh, our trainer do today is all positively reinforced. Um, she has a bucket here of food that Kelly really enjoys. So today's Kelly is getting apples and sweet potato and celery and things like that. Uh, when Kelly does the right thing, she'll get some food for it. So we're going to show you guys her feet real quick. You guys, we can talk about that a little bit. About 60% of elephants' weight are resting around those front feet. The other 40% is on their back feet. Uh, elephants have very large nails. Can you guys still see me? Yeah. Okay. Becky, it's just you. All right. So let's talk about the foot a little bit. Five large nails going across the front. They have a, a protective pad on the bottom of their foot. It acts a lot like the bottom of a sneaker. It has little grooves on it. And uh, we'll actually go in there and clean those grooves out, um, get debris and rocks and things like out of their foot. Um, that can prevent any kind of um, problem with their foot, any kind of infection and things like that. Their other foot there. So they're trained, they're, like I say, they're husbandry behaviors. We check their feet every day. Next thing we're going to show you are Kelly's ears. African elephants have those very large ears that are known for African elephants. Um, they're about just as thin as our ears. One of the things you'll notice if you can see it, is that Kelly has little cuts and tears around her ears. Uh, that's just natural wear and tear. Elephants' ears are very thin, and just from them moving around their environment, they're going to fray their ears throughout their life. It's kind of like us wearing the same jeans. Throughout life, you're going to tear up the, the knees and the cuffs of the jeans. The easy way, a lot of times, um, researchers will ID elephants. Sometimes they'll just do it by the notches in their ears. So that's a little bit about Kelly. If you guys have any questions about her, I have a question. Yes. Does she ever vocalize? She does vocalize. That's a very good question. And what does she do? Does she do rumbles? She does rumble a lot. Um, Kelly will, will rumble a lot when the keepers come in in the morning, mm -hmm. when, she, when she knows she's gonna about to get her breakfast and know things are going to get started. Um, every now and then she will trumpet, the, uh, that, that trumpet that we all know the elephants will make. Um, usually when she does that, it's when she's excited about something or um, sometimes she'll get agitated about something and she'll trumpet then. Um, the most common times that they'll trumpet really is if that are two elephants. We have two here at Zoo Atlanta. Oh, okay. if, if they've been separated for a while and we put them back together, um, that's really the time that usually they get most excited and will, they'll usually trumpet then. Um, yeah, you can also hear them rumbling um, between the two of them if they're if they're across the yard or if they're separating the barn for some sort of activity like a bath. Um, sometimes you can hear them rumbling and you know basically talking to each other that way. Is the other one a female? They're both females. Okay. Uh, we have two girls. They're both 31 years old. 
Mm -hmm. um, they've been together for close to 30 years, about 28 years now. Both these girls came to Zoo Atlanta in uh, 1986, and they have been together uh, ever since then. It's humongous animals, right? And then this is the largest land mammal. Um, like I said, Kelly is about 8,000 pounds. Um, this is the kind of species that we don't want to see disappear from the world, and uh, it's efforts like 96 elephants and campaigns of the past that are um, really helping to do that. Um, like they mentioned earlier, um, I know you guys are, are young out there, but and you know I know your kids and your grandkids want to be able to come to places like zoos and maybe even you know, out into Africa and Asia and be able to see elephants in the wild too. Um, they're incredibly smart. Um, elephants are one of the smartest species on the planet. Um, they learn things really fast. Kelly here, she knows close to 50 different behaviors. And I think about maybe like what your dog might know or what, uh, you know, what pretty much any other animal you could train to do. 50 behaviors is a lot. Um, and she learns new ones every year. So that's going to keep growing up, keep getting bigger. Um, like I said, Kelly is 31. That's about middle age for an elephant. So by the time she hits 50 or 60, she's going to know a lot more than 50 behaviors. Um, and a lot of that kind of goes into the fact they're just such a social animal which makes it a lot more interesting too. Um, but as far as like a keeper standpoint, the training is just its incredibly rewarding with elephants. Um, they give back just as much as you put in. And um, they all have their own personalities. Kelly is a very um, energetic elephant, I guess would be a good way to put it. And uh, it's, just, it's just a real uh, thrill to be able to work with them every day. So I, I want to wrap it up. Uh, there will be the past video. We'll try and patch them together. Uh, right now we're joined by Erin Prada at Wildlife Conservation Society, and she just kind of wants to go over some takeaways from 96 elephants. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for your patience um, with our technical difficulties today. Um, we really just wanted to um, get the word out there with high school students and young adult audiences build awareness around this campaign. Um, it really is a call to action. Um, we do not want to be the generation um, that allows elephants to disappear. So some really simple take actions you can do right now. Um, visit the 96 elephants website, 96elephants.org. Um, the first thing you can do is join our herd. Um, join the herd by taking the pledge. Um, and that pledge is basically stating that you will not buy or sell ivory and that you will support a moratorium on ivory products in your state or other states um, if you choose to put in the time. Um, after that, you can scroll down and click on Take Action. We really want you to help spread the word. Um, utilize all of the social media channels you're connected with. You can click on our ad. Um, you can utilize all of our Facebook photos and posts. Get the word out there to your family and friends about this um, cause. Um, and then we also want you to really participate in our Instagram campaign. Um, take part by creating an Elfie. Um, celebrate elephants. Um, take a photo of you with um, an elephant at a local zoo, um, a photo of you with an elephant in the wild if you've had that um, great pleasure. Um, and also, if you find yourself really imitating elephant characteristics, hey, a photo of you um, it's showing a similarity between you and an elephant is, is also a great celebration of them. Um, so those are three ways that you can get involved now. Um, when you're on the website, there are additional ways you can participate, um, but we don't want to go into those now because they're, they're pretty detailed. So please, just explore, explore, and reach out to us um, for help. Uh, so, yeah, we made an Elfie yesterday. There's a panda on it. Don't worry, pandas. Um, we're, I'm lucky I get to work at a zoo, so maybe I get an elephant in the background of my Elfie, but it's so cool to, to do, make an Elfie, hashtag, put it on Instagram. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. This is Zoo Atlanta's 15th Hangout on Air. You can check out the rest of them. They're pretty much technically, technically efficient hangouts at zooatlanta.org slash hangouts. Also be sure to circle up with Wildlife Conservation Society and Zoo Atlanta on Google Plus. Thank you and have a great day and also thank you to all our panelists that we lost earlier. They were amazing. Thanks everyone. Bye.